أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحر العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين In our last lesson we are still talking about المؤاخات the incident of Mu'akhat, and we shed light on multiple points. Firstly, we mentioned some, some of the philosophies behind Al-Mu'akhat, and we said that one main philosophy was to bring the Muslims closer to each other, to make them more united, because unity is needed, especially when a person is facing great challenges. When a particular group faces great challenges, it's very important that the group remains united. Knowing that Muslims were facing internal and external challenges, as in there were enemies who were infidels, who were disbelievers, and openly stating that they will fight Islam and Muslims. But then again, there were enemies who were fighting Islam in secret, known as the hypocrites. Knowing that there were external and internal enemies who were fighting Islam, seeking to destroy this religion in one way or another, the real Muslims had to remain united. Thus, it was very important it was extremely important to inform them that a believer isn't a mere friend of a believer. A Muslim isn't a mere friend. He is in reality what? He is a brother of another Muslim. And a mu'min, a believer, is a brother of another mu'min. Allah said what? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً This is a bold and explicit statement indicating that believers are brothers in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not biological brothers, rather spiritual brothers. And the spiritual bond, as you know, is stronger than the biological bond. The spiritual bond is stronger and more important than the biological bond. Sometimes you might have a biological brother who is an enemy to you, such as Habil and Qabil, correct? Habil alayhi salam was Qabil's biological brother and vice versa. But they ended up to be enemies because this one, Habil alayhi salam, was Adam's successor and was the embodiment of piety during his time, whereas Qabil was an enemy of God and was the first person in the history of mankind to commit murder. To commit murder, meaning unlawful murder. So, sometimes you might have a biological brother, but ultimately there is no spiritual bond because both of you are on different sides. You're fo following a Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path, and he's following the crooked path, the path that takes you to hellfire. So the spiritual bond is more important and it is stronger. This was one of the philosophies we mentioned last week. We also shed light on other philosophies as well, such as uh, the fact that uh, several Muslims Many Muslims uh, lost their family members. Why? Did their family members die? No, they didn't die. But they lost their family members because they were disowned by their families. 
or detached from their families for one reason or another. Primarily because they chose Islam and their family members uh, remained as kuffar, they remained as disbelievers. So when the Prophet ﷺ informed the Muslims that ultimately each one of you is a brother to the other, he was kind of compensating the Muslims who had lost their family members. It was as if he's telling them that don't worry, don't grieve, for from now on we will be your family members. <clears throat> Another point that we analyzed last week was uh, the names of the companions that were present in the first Mu'akhat. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Mu'akhat that took place before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi migrated. We looked at those names and we saw who was joined with who. And by reading the names we realized that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was putting each individual in a, in a group. He was putting each individual, individual with another person who resembled him to a certain degree. Who resembled him to a certain degree. Keep that point in mind because today, inshallah, we will need it. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. Last but not least, we mentioned, as we mentioned two lessons ago as well, that in both incidents of Mu'akhat, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi chose Imam Ali alayhi salam to be his akh, to be his brother. Why? Simply because Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam had the exact traits that Rasulullah had, excluding Nubuwa, excluding prophethood. So he was a real brother because he was the like of Rasulullah. He was Rasulullah's equal. Again, I stress on this point that he had all the traits Rasulullah had, excluding what? Excluding Nubuwa, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi are we saying that Imam Ali alayhi salam is more important than Rasulullah? No, we're not. Are we saying that, uh, you know, are we saying that uh, both of them are on the same level? We're not saying this. Ultimately, the traditions do indicate that Rasulullah is, is Imam Ali's master and is uh, greater or better than Imam Ali alayhi salam, at least from a particular perspective. But if we put Nubuwa aside, if we put the Prophet's prophethood aside, we'll find that Imam Ali السلام, was an exact copy of Rasulullah. He was a walking, talking, living, breathing Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihim. Hence, he and he only deserved the title of Akhu Rasulullah, the brother of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him and his family. We concluded the lesson last week with a hadith that Ahmad ibn Hanbal and other scholars also mentioned. And in that hadith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned hadith al-manzila. He mentioned <clears throat> that Imam Ali was to him as Aaron was to Moses alayhi salam. This is known as Hadith al-Manzila. When he tells him, أنت مني بمنزلة هارون من موسى إلا أنه لا نبي بعدي. You are to me as Aaron was to Moses, except that there are no prophets after me. And according to the Hadith we read, he also told him, وأنت أخي ووارثي. And you are my brother and inheritor. Hence, today, inshallah, the first point we want to speak of or speak about is Hadith al-Manzila followed by the word warith, inheritor. What does the Prophet mean, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when he says that Imam Ali, alayhi salam, is his inheritor? If you remember, I told you that Hadith al-Manzila was mentioned multiple times by the Prophet. It was mentioned when Rasulullah went on the expedition of Tabuk 
and left Imam Ali alayhi salam uh, in Medina. This was the only battle Rasulullah went to without Imam Ali. Peace be upon them both. And inshallah we will analyze that battle in the future in detail. Now why would he leave Imam Ali behind in Medina? He left him in Medina because Medina was in great danger. Rasulullah knew that the Muslims were facing two dangers. An external danger caused by the Romans. Hence, they had to go to Tabuk to face the Romans. And an internal danger caused by who? By the Munafiqeen, by the uh, hypocrites. So this time Rasulullah couldn't leave Medina sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, by simply uh, appoint, appointing a normal companion such as for example Ibn Umm Maktoum to be the caretaker of Medina during Rasulullah's absence. No. There was a need for Rasulullah himself to remain in Medina. Thus, what did he do? Rasulullah left. He went to Tabuk and he left his own nafs, his self, the walking, talking, living Muhammad called Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, to be the caretaker of Medina. And he explained this issue to the Muslims. You know, when Imam Ali alayhi salam, was left in Medina, the hypocrites, um, the hypocrites, made certain rumors saying that, you know, Rasulullah didn't take Ali with him to Tabuk because he doesn't like Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, he likes to be distant from him, etc. So the Imam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa and he, um, he asked him why was he left in Medina, although he knew, but he wanted the Muslims to hear. And Rasulullah told him that there was a must, there was a must that he or Ali remains in Medina in order to protect it. So, when the Prophet was going to leave to Tabuk, and Imam Ali came to the Prophet asking him why was he left in Medina, Rasulullah told him what? He said the famous hadith known as Hadith al-Manzila. Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa illa anna hula nabiyya ba'di. You are to me as Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no Prophet after me. Was this the only incident in which Rasulullah mentioned Hadith al-Manzila? No, it wasn't. He mentioned it multiple times in his life. In fact, it was mentioned to Rasulullah during multiple times as well. I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week, but in case I did, we'll repeat ourselves. When Hassan and Hussein were born, alayhima salat was salam, we have a tradition by Imam al-Sajjad which says that Jibra'il came to Rasulullah and he conveyed a message from Allah Azza wa Jal telling him what? Telling him Ali is to you as Aaron was to Moses except there is no prophet after you. So name your grandson uh, by the name of Harun's son. Give him the name of Harun's son. When Hassan was born Rasulullah asked, he said, what was Harun's son's name? He was told Shubbar. So he said, Lisani Arabi, I speak Arabic. Bear in mind, Rasulullah spoke all languages. All the languages of humans, animals, and any language you can think of. However, his mother tongue was what? Was Arabic. Hence, he told him Lisani Arabi. So he told him, name him Al-Hasan. So he named him Al-Hasan. When Hussein was born, the same incident happened. And this time, Jibra'il came to Rasulullah telling him again, Ali is to you as Aaron was to Moses, except there's no prophet after you. Allah tells you to, to give this grandson of yours the name of Harun's other son. <coughs> so he told him, what was his name? He said, Shubair. He told him, Lisani Arabi. My mother tongue is Arabic. So he told him, call him Al-Husayn. And he called him Al-Husayn. 
So Hadith al-Manzila wasn't mentioned once. Keep that point in mind. In case you're writing notes, write the following note. Hadith al-Manzila was mentioned in multiple instances. It was mentioned in multiple instances during the Prophet's time, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Here you might ask, why are you stressing on this point? What difference does it make whether Rasulullah mentioned Hadith al-Manzila only when he went to Tabuk or he mentioned it, <coughs> excuse me, or he mentioned it multiple times in his life? The issue is, in reality, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a big difference. As in, even if Rasulullah only mentioned Hadith al-Manzila before going to Tabuk, we would still understand from Hadith al-Manzila whatever we're going to mention today, inshallah ta'ala. However, when we understand that it was mentioned in multiple instances, not only before the Battle of Tabuk, before the expedition of Tabuk, it becomes clear to us and or to other Muslims that this hadith means whatever we're going to mention. Because basically you have some <clears throat> people who don't follow Ahlul Bayt السلام, who came forward and said Hadith al-Manzila indicates that Ali السلام, was Rasulullah's caliph during his life only, only during his life. Why? Because Harun alayhi salam was Musa's caliph during his life. Musa went to speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before going to speak with God, azza wa jal, to bring guidance from God to Banu Israel, this was after Pharaoh had been destroyed by God subhanahu wa ta'ala with his army. Musa alayhi salam told Banu Israel that he was leaving and that he will be absent for 30 nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to make those 30 nights 40 nights. He decided to you know, stretch Musa's absence by 10 nights in order to test Banu Israel. So Musa went alayhi salam, but before going to speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to bring guidance from God, what did he do? He appointed Harun as his caliph. He appointed Harun as his caliph and he told Banu Israel that Harun alayhi salam was in charge of, of guiding them. He was their guide during Musa's absence. So it's as if he was telling them, if you go through any trial, if you have any questions, if you need any guidance, please refer to Harun. Because Harun's presence during my absence is equal to my presence. It's as if Musa is right there with you. So Musa left and he left Harun as what? As his caliph amongst his people. Meaning he was in charge of guiding them during the absence of Harun alayhi salam. Now you have certain individuals, certain Sunni scholars who came forward and said, Hadith al-Manzila is accepted, we can't refute it, but all that Hadith al-Manzila indicates is that Imam Ali alayhi salam was Rasulullah's caliph over the people of Medina during his absence, case closed, that's it. When, during the expedition of Tabu, I repeat, they said, the only thing we can understand from Hadith al-Manzila is that Ali alayhi salam was Rasulullah's caliph during his absence when he went to Tabuk and he was his caliph over who over the people of Medina case closed we said wrong this meaning is true but it's not the only meaning we derive from hadith al-manzila this is a partial meaning this is a a, a part of of hadith al-manzila in simpler or clearer terms Hadith al-Manzila does indicate that Imam Ali was Rasulullah's caliph over the people of Medina when he went to Tabuk. But it indicates much more than that. So, 
when we realize that Hadith al-Manzila was said in multiple instances, it was said during the first Mu'akhat and the second Mu'akhat. Jibra'il reminded Rasulullah of this Hadith during the birth of Hassan and during the birth of Hussein, alayhima salatu wasalam. It was also said in the expedition of Tabuk. It was also said when Rasulullah one day visited the mother of Anas bin Malik, rahmatullah alayha. And in other instances, such as the instance of Sadd al Abwab, which we will analyze soon, inshallah. Sadd al Abwab. What is that? It's an event in which the Prophet commands the Muslims to close the doors, to seal all of the doors they had in their homes, which would lead them to his mosque. Except for who? Except for Ali. He told them Allah Ta'ala commands all of you to seal those doors and to completely close them. To seal those doors which would lead you to the mosque. He only excluded Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and of course himself, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So when he mentions Hadith al-Manzila multiple times, including when he goes to the expedition of Tabuk, we understand that Rasulullah is basically saying Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi, All of the duties that were placed on Harun's shoulders Alayhi salam In regards to Musa's message Will be placed on the shoulders of Ali Salamullahi alayhi How do we understand this? We understand it because of the following. The hadith said what? You are to me as Aaron was to Moses. Which means that Ali is the Harun of Rasulullah. Which means that he basically carries out all of the tasks that Harun would carry out when he would be supporting Musa. Here you might ask Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, is there, you know, one task or a few tasks that are excluded. Rasulullah says, yes, there's only one that's excluded. Except that there's no prophet after me. Harun was a prophet. And Rasulullah wanted to make clear to the Muslims, he wanted to make it clear to the Muslims, that there is no prophet after him. So Ali salam isn't a prophet. By only mentioning Nubuwa, by only excluding Nubuwa, Rasulullah was confirming all of the other duties that Harun alayhi salam held or Harun carried out. So through Hadith al-Manzila, we understand that all of the roles Harun played in Musa's message alayhi salam were played by Imam Ali alayhi salam. All of the duties Harun had to carry out excluding the duty of nubuwa, prophethood, were going to be carried out or had to be carried out by Imam Ali, alayhi, afdal salatu wassalam. What are some of those duties? You'll ask. What are some of those duties? One of them is to be Musa's first aid. Harun was Musa's first aid, his main supporter, Al Wazir. And Imam Ali salam, was the same. Hence, you have traditions explicitly mentioning that Imam Ali is the Wazir of Rasulullah, his main aid, his main supporter. It's one thing to have a supporter or to have 10, 20, or 100, or 200 supporters. But then again, there's always that one person you mainly depend on. Who was that person for Musa? It was Harun. Who was that person for Muhammad? It was Ali. Alayhim salatu salam jami'an. That was one role. Another one was, was sharaka, to be the associate of the Prophet in his message. Musa alayhi salam, when he supplicates according to the Holy Quran, and he asks Allah azza wa jal 
to send Harun with him so he may face Pharaoh, Musa says what? وَأَشْرِكْهُ فِي أَمْرِي Make him my associate or my partner in my affair. So Harun was Musa's partner in what? In delivering the Musawi message. Now the message of God descended on Musa السلام, during that time. But Harun عليه, was carrying that message with Musa السلام, which indicates that he wasn't any normal follower of Musa. He wasn't any normal believer from Banu Israel simply following Musa. No. He had a great role to play and that was to help Musa in delivering his message. The same applies to who? To Imam Ali alayhi salam. He was Sharik al Nabi. Now, when certain people hear this, they might say, Hold on, are you saying Ali alayhi salam receives wahi? He receives revelation from uh, Jabrail? No, we're not saying that. He doesn't receive revelation from Jabrail. Rasulullah receives revelation. He is the one who receives al wahi from Jabrail alayhi salam, which is ultimately wahi from Allah azza wa jal. From God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we are saying that Imam Ali as well wasn't your normal believer who was just simply following Rasulullah. No, he was more than that. Rasulullah depended on Imam Ali alayhi salam to actually deliver his message. There were certain uh, there were certain instances in the history of Islam in which Imam Ali السلام, played a vital role in doing what? In delivering the Prophet's message. Don't misunderstand us. We're not saying that you know Rasulullah is just you know sitting back, relaxing, and Amir al Mu'min is doing all the work. No, on, on the contrary, Rasulullah did a lot of work and he was the essence of the message, the founder of the message. But Ali was his what was his sharik. His associate. To clarify what I mean, I'll give you an example. And by the way, I'm trying to, to be as concise as possible with, with hadith, and hadith al-Manzila because if we want, we can have a series of lectures on just this one topic. Let me give you an example. Take the example of Surat Bara'a. Surat Bara'a was one of the last chapters to come down. One of the last chapters to come down on the Prophet. It came down after Fatah Mecca. After Fatah Mecca. When it came down, either all of it or the first few verses of it, Rasulullah wanted someone to go to the people of Mecca and read Surat Bara'a or the few, first few verses of Surat Bara'a in front of them. Question. Question. Usually, who's the one who reads Quran to, pe to people? Who's the person who stands and says, Oh, people, you know, we have a new message from God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufu an ahad, for example. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But in this instance, when Bara'a came down, and Rasulullah wanted one person to read the verses of Bara'a for the first time in front of the people of Mecca. Who was chosen? Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. Amir al-Mu'mineen. Yes, the tradition does say that Rasulullah chose Abu Bakr at the beginning. And Abu Bakr took Surat Bara'a and he went towards Mecca. Now there's a reason why he chose Abu Bakr. But we need to contemplate to understand that reason. So he went. Shortly after Jabrail comes down on the Prophet and tells him what? He tells him, لا يؤدي عنك إلا أنت أو رجل منك. He gives him a message from God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he tells him, only you or a person who is from you, a man who is from you, can deliver your message. So he's telling him basically that Ya Rasulullah, when you want to deliver the message of Islam, when you want to deliver, for example, the verses of the Quran, uh, 
you have to choose between two people, either you, yourself, you deliver the message, you deliver the verses, or a man who comes from you. The Prophet says what? In another hadith, he says, Ali minni wa ana minhu wa huwa wali kulli mu'minin ba'di. He says that Ali is from him, and he is from Ali, and Ali is the guardian of all believers after him. Salawatullah alayhima wa alihima. Thus, the Prophet sent Imam Ali and told him to take Bara'a, Surah Bara'a from Abu Bakr. The Imam did, and he continued his way to the people of Mecca and delivered, delivered the verses of Surah Bara'a to the people of Mecca. That was an instance manifesting that Imam Ali alayhi salam wasn't a mere believer in Rasulullah. He wasn't your average believer. He was much more than that. He was his partner in delivering the message. Thus, in a different hadith, Jabrail tells the Prophet when he comes down upon him, as Abu Bakr was on his way to Mecca, uh, only you or Ali, only you or Ali can deliver your message. That you add the anka illa anta or Ali. Case closed. Now, the question is, the question that remains is, why would he send Abu Bakr from the first place? Rasulullah wants to clarify certain issues to the Muslims. He wants to show them. He wants to show them with all due respect to our Sunni brothers and sisters. He wants to show them who is actually eligible to deliver the message of Rasulullah on his behalf and who isn't. He wants to show them that Abu Bakr bin Abi Quhafa, with all due respect, the first caliph, doesn't have the traits which enable him to deliver the message on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I think this is clear if we contemplate on the hadith and the wording of Jibra'il, or sorry, the words of Jibra'il alayhi salam, when he tells him, لا يؤدي عنك إلا أنت أو رجل من. What other meanings do we derive from Hadith al-Manzilah? Until now we've derived al-Wizara, Harun was Musa's wazir, and Ali was Muhammad's wazir, meaning his first eight, his main supporter. What else? Sharaka, both of them were the associates of the prophet of their time. What's the third meaning? A third, a third role, excuse me, that Harun played, salamullah alayhi, was succeeding Musa, to be Musa's successor and caliph. This is clear when we look at the Quran. We said when Musa went to, um, when Musa alayhi salam went to speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who did he leave behind as his caliph? Harun, salamullah alayhi, which, excuse me, which means that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wasallam, will leave this world, who will be his caliph? Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi His caliph will be Ali ibn Abi Talib. Bear in mind that Harun was supposed to be Musa's successor after his death as well. But subhanallah, Allah azza wa jal decreed that Harun passes away before Musa. Thus, a new successor was appointed, and that was Joshua, Joshua son of Nun, known in Arabic as Yusha ibn Nun, alayhima salam. Even the Jews today, they, they agree with us on this regard. According to the, the Old Testament, the successor of uh, Musa was Joshua son of Nun, alayhima salam. So the hadith indicates a lot. It doesn't indicate, you know, it doesn't point to one or two roles that Musa, that sorry, Harun alayhi salam uh, carried out when he was supporting Musa alayhi salam. No, no, no. The hadith 
is a very important and critical hadith indicating that all of the roles Harun played عليه, during uh, Musa's time when Musa was propagating his message will be played by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salat wassalam during Rasulullah's life and or after his death sallallahu alayhi wa alihi You might ask, suppose that, suppose that Hadith al-Manzila was only mentioned in, in Tabuk, before Rasulullah went to Tabuk. Would the Hadith imply, uh, would the Hadith uh, point to the same meanings you mentioned? Yes, it would. It would. Without doubt, it would, if we analyze the Hadith carefully. But as I told you um, in this lesson, as I told you, when we understand that the hadith, hadith al-manzila was uttered in multiple instances during Rasulullah's life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this issue becomes clearer. It becomes clearer that hadith al-manzila points to all of the meanings that we mentioned. Do we have a question about Hadith al-Manzila? No, Shaykh. Any questions, brothers, sisters? Inshallah, all the points are clear. No questions. No questions? Let me mention one more point, and then we'll go to warith, the word warith, and what does it imply. One last point that we can also derive from Hadith al-Manzila is that Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam is superior to all Muslims. No one, uh, no one is as great as Imam Ali, excluding Rasulullah, of course. After the Prophet وسلم, no Muslim is as great as Imam Ali. Thus he is what he is superior to all Muslimin. Which implies that he was their master after Rasulullah. He was the rightful caliph. He was the rightful successor. Because the intellect, the intellect tells you the successor of the prophet the caliph of the prophet must be the greatest person amongst the muslims it doesn't make sense to come to come and say that the caliph of rasulullah was a person inferior to some of the people he was in charge of guiding again i repeat it doesn't make sense to say that the caliph was a person inferior to some of the Muslims. He was what? He was in charge of guiding. If he's inferior to them, if he's not greater or better than them, then why would he be the caliph? They would, they would deserve to be the caliphs more than him. So the intellect says... The Imam after Rasulullah, the Caliph after Rasulullah, the Wasi, the successor after Rasulullah, must be the greatest person amongst the Muslims during his time. Hence, you find when you look at the Imams we believe in, from Ali to Al Mahdi, Salamullahi Alihim Ajma'in wa Ajarallah Ta'ala Faraja, you find that they had no likes. They were always at the top of the pyramid during their times. No Muslim who was living during their eras, alayhim salam, was greater than them or better than them. On the contrary, they were the best during their eras, alayhim salam.
Hadith al-Manzila indicates that Ali is number one after Rasulullah. Why? Simply because Harun was number one after Musa. If Harun wasn't the greatest person amongst Banu Israel after Musa alayhi salam, then why would Musa choose him to be the caliph? If there was someone better than Harun, then Musa alayhi salam would have chosen that person to be his caliph during his absence when he went to speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But by choosing Harun, implicitly, Musa was telling Banu Israel, this man is the greatest man amongst you. Knowing that Hadith al-Manzila tells you all of the roles Harun played السلام, will be played by Imam Ali, excluding Nubuwa. Knowing that Hadith al-Manzila indicates that Ali is the Harun, is the Aaron of this nation. We understand from Hadith al-Manzila itself that Ali was number one after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now you might ask, isn't there any other hadith which is more explicit than Hadith al-Manzila indicating that Imam Ali was the greatest after Rasulullah? Of course, we have plenty of ahadith, plenty, walillah alhamd. But that doesn't mean we should disregard Hadith al-Manzila. There's one beautiful point regarding this hadith, and that is it can't be refuted. You see, me and you, we can bring, for example, a hadith from Al-Kafi stating all of what we mentioned and more explicitly. But possibly your Sunni brother or sister will tell you, excuse me, you know, this hadith is in Al-Kafi, it's not in Bukhari, for example. Or it's not in Muslim, or it's not in, in Nasai, etc. Possibly. Some ahadith were only narrated by Shias. Although there are plenty of ahadith that Sunnis and Shias have agreed on, just as there are certain ahadith that have only been narrated by Sunnis. Okay? Hadith al Manzila is one of those narrations that Muslims in general narrated. Even Al Bukhari mentions it in As Sahih, in his book As Sahih. So it can't be refuted. Hence, let us make use of Hadith al Manzila. This is why we're taking our time to analyze Hadith al-Manzila, to see what it means, because it can't be refuted. All Muslims know that it was uttered by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now, if someone wants to be blind and wants to come forward and say, no, Rasulullah didn't say this hadith, let him be blind. It's his choice. If you want to be blind, that, that's your choice. But, you know, if you cover your eyes, trying to stop yourself from seeing the sun, the sun will still be there. It's just you who won't be seeing it. The same applies to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salat wasalam. When you have certain so-called scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah who will come and neglect as many virtues for Imam Ali alayhi salam as possible. We tell him you can, you can, you know, close your eyes. In fact, you can cover your eyes, Ibn Taymiyyah, as much as you want. But ultimately the sun will remain there. It's there. Anyone who wants to see it can see it. طيب. What does the word warith indicate? If you remember, when we mentioned the tradition that Ahmad bin Hanbal mentioned and other scholars, the Prophet told Imam Ali that he is his warith. He is his inheritor. Okay? Let me just send you the part of the hadith which says, said this. He said, وَأَنْتَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَىٰ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي وَأَنْتَ أَخِي وَوَارِثِي وَارِثِي My inheritor. What we understand from the word my inheritor is one of two points. Either Rasulullah means, Ya Ali, you will inherit my knowledge. So all of the knowledge that Rasulullah had will be passed down to Ali, salawatullahi alayhima wa alihima. 
That's one meaning we can derive from the word warith, warithi, warithi, which is true. We do have plenty of narrations indicating that uh, the knowledge of Rasulullah was passed down to Imam Ali. Whatever Rasulullah knew, Imam Ali knew. Alayhim as-salatu wa alihim. So all of the knowledge of the Prophet was passed down to Imam Ali. Hence he said in his famous word, Ana Madinatul Alim wa Aliyun Babuha. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. فَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْمَدِينَةَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ فَلْيَأْتِهَا مِنْ بَابِهَا So whosoever wants to reach the city of knowledge and wants to reach wisdom, let him enter that city from its gate. Meaning go to Ali, alayhi salam. The second meaning we can derive from the word warithi is that not only will he, not only will he inherit Rasulullah's knowledge, but he'll inherit his knowledge and his properties as well. Uh, sorry, not properties, his um, his wealth. He will inherit Rasulullah's knowledge and Rasulullah's um, items, wealth, the estate of Rasulullah basically. The items that Rasulullah leaves behind. After his death. So what we're saying is the word warithi either points to the first meaning or to the second meaning. Based on the second meaning, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam will be the person who does what? Who possesses the estate of Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What does that imply? It implies that when Fatima sallallahu alayhi claimed that Fadak was hers, Fadak was truly hers. Fadak was for Lady Fatima and it was usurped by those who opposed Ali and Fatima alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Bear in mind, this is not the only hadith which indicates that Fadak belonged to Fatima al-Zahra. No, we have Quranic verses and or narrations indicating that Fadak belonged to Sayyidah Fatima. We have at least one Quranic verse, if not more. And we have multiple traditions indicating that Fadak was hers. But one of those narrations which will indicate that Fadak belongs to Sayyidah Fatima a.s. Is this one, Warithi, when he says, you are my inheritor. If Imam Ali alayhi salam inherits Rasulullah's estate, and Imam Ali himself, according to history, comes forth and tells Abu Bakr, I testify that Fadak belongs to Fatima, salamullah alayha. What does that mean? It means it actually belongs to Fatima. For if it belonged to Rasulullah and Rasulullah didn't give it to Fatima after, uh, sorry, before his death, Rasulullah didn't give it to her before his death, then naturally Fadak will be inherited by who? By Imam Ali. Alayhi salam. So when the Imam says that. Fatima alayhi salatu salam, Fadak belongs to her. This means that it didn't even belong to him. It didn't belong to him. It was given by Rasulullah to who? To Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salatu salam. And that was the case. Rasulullah gave it to Sayyidah Zahra during his life. But even then, just to add... Um, to, to give you more information, even then, Sayyidah Zahra السلام, used two arguments against Abu Bakr to prove that Fadak was hers. Two arguments. The first one was that Rasulullah gave her Fadak during his life. The second one was she told Abu Bakr that. If we suppose, if we suppose 
that Rasulullah didn't give me fadak during his life, fadak will still be mine. Because I would inherit my father. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa She's his daughter, so she inherits him. Tamam? So she used both arguments against Abu Bakr. The first one was that he, uh, that Rasulullah gave her fadak during his life. And the second one was that Rasulullah, uh, that she would inherit Rasulullah even if she wasn't given or gifted the land of fadak during the Prophet's time, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Is this point clear, inshallah? For sure. Ahsantum. So, just to wrap up, the word warithi indicates, either indicates that Imam Ali inherited all of Rasulullah's knowledge, or he inherited all of his knowledge, including what? Including the estate, the um, the, the estate of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So when Imam Ali alayhi salam comes forth and testifies in favor of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salatu wa salam, saying that Fadak belongs to her, since he is the warith of Rasulullah, whether we consider him to be the warith of his knowledge or the knowledge and the estate of Rasulullah, his testimony will indicate that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu was salam, uh, Fadak truly belonged to her and no one other than her. His testimony will indicate that Rasulullah gave Lady Fatima Fadak during his life. And even if we suppose, even if we suppose that he didn't, although he did, Jayid, the testimony of Ali alayhi salam will indicate that Fatima uh, is the rightful owner of Fadak because she also inherits the Prophet. If the main inheritor is saying what? Is saying Fadak belongs to her, then that means Fadak belongs to her. Next week, inshallah, we'll continue with Al Mu'akhat. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al Mustafa Muhammadin. Wa alihi tayyibin al Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa ajil farajahum.